make him fly also. Charlotte Soccer Show, John Hayes, Danny Grant, Brams, and our, our special guest today, Danny. He's Graham Ruffin from the Total Soccer Show, also from the Soccer Dispatch. It's a pleasure, Graham, to have you on the show today. And somehow, some way, you've beaten Ryan Bailey <laughs> to the Charlotte Soccer Show. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Yeah, Ryan Bailey tells me all about Charlotte FC on a weekly basis. So it's good to combine that world with my other world of Scottish football. And frankly, an aberration that Ryan Bailey... The Billy Joe Armstrong impersonator himself has not been on the show, and I have somehow beaten him to that punch. Yeah, he's uh, he's a good uh, Charlotte Charlotte lover, and uh, he has an open invite. He's had an open invite for two years. He just uh, doesn't been able to find the time. So thank you for being able to find the time, Graham. And is he is he bragging now that he thinks he's a big rock star? Like, what's it like over in the TSS uh, scene with Ryan's oh. new fame and fortune there? No more than usual. You know what Ryan's Ryan's like. Uh, yeah, he's uh, he he talks about Charlotte a lot. Sometimes we rib him about Charlotte. Things are looking a little bit more positive now than they have the last couple seasons. So maybe this season is when he's going to get his own back and and Charlotte are going to put some uh, results on the board this year. Well, it's an a- absolute pleasure to have you here. Uh, we're huge fans of, of Total Soccer Show and and what what you and Taylor and and Joe and Ryan, of course, have been able to do over there on that show. The weekend review on a, is a must listen to episode coming off of a weekend of of global football. Uh, yeah, you can listen to Charlotte Soccer Show. We're going to talk about Charlotte FC for about an hour to ninety minutes, uh, but there's a lot more happening out there um, in in the world of of soccer. The reason why Graham, you're here today, we had to we had to call in our correspondent from Glasgow to talk about Charlotte FC's uh, newest player, Lee Alabada, uh, a, a now former Celtic player. It hasn't been announced yet officially, but all signs are, are pointing to to this being confirmed, just not officially confirmed. And we wanted to have you on the show today to to learn a little bit about Charlotte FC's newest winger, uh, something Dean Smith has, has identified as a, a hole for this squad. But I think first and foremost, you know, when you look at kind of Charlotte FC's transfer history, you don't see a lot of 22-year-old uh, wingers coming into to MLS, especially at a young DP position. Uh, how did this transfer happen? Yeah, so Abada, he's a, he's a tremendous talent who has been one of Celtic's best players over the last three seasons or so. So I'll give you a little bit of background on him. He was a big part of the, the big Ange revolution at, at, at Celtic, the Ange Postacoglu revolution. That took place in the summer of 2021 when Postacoglu came in. And he basically completely rebuilt the squad in, in that summer. And I mean Postacoglu did it himself. They basically just pushed the sporting director to the sides and Postacoglu brought his players in. And Leal Labada was one of those players. Um, a lot of the supporters at that time believed it would be a two-year building process, rebuilding process for Celtic. But Abada was one of the players who came in and immediately hit the ground running. He finished with them, um, just looking at some numbers here, 10 goals and six assists in the league that first season. Celtic went on to win the, the, the league title that year, which was so, kind of unexpected. And then he matched it almost exactly. So 10 goals and, and five assists in the league the, the following season. So that gives an, an impression of the consistency that he's able to achieve. He um he wasn't always first choice for Postacoglu last season because there was this other player called Felipe Jota who was a truly sensational talent and he would often play on the right wing which is where Abada's most comfortable. But then Jota was sold to Al Etihad in the the Saudi Pro League last summer and at that point everyone expected Abada to to step up and and be the main man for Celtic this season. He signed a new four year contract with Celtic in September which was a reflection of this expectation. But then there was the the Hamas attacks in Israel the, the very next month, Abada uh, being a, an Israeli, and then the bombings in, 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 in Gaza. And Celtic is a, is a club with a fan base that has has historically sided with, with Palestine, and they have staged a number of protests this season. They've held up Palestinian flags at a number of matches this season. Due to this, Abada ultimately decided he didn't want to play for Celtic anymore, and that has uh, that has led to him leaving the club I know that sounds like quite a, a kind of a, a nasty and um, prickly situation, uh, and obviously in the wider sense, it absolutely is. 
But to be honest, a bad will leave Celtic with, I think, generally the, the good wishes of, of, of the Celtic fans. Brendan Rodgers has spoken well about a bad situation. I think most at Celtic appreciate that he just felt he, could, he couldn't play for Celtic anymore. So that's how he became available. It's not normal that Celtic would be selling a player at this stage of their development, particularly after handing him a new four-year deal in September. Um, but he's not leaving Celtic because he's not good enough. Far from it. I think this is a really, really smart pickup by uh, Charlotte FC. Yeah, he's also not leaving uh, a player at this stage of his development is not coming to MLS under normal circumstances either, right? Yeah, absolutely. 22 years old. Obviously, recently we've um, seen Inter Miami build a, a team of geriatrics, talented geriatrics, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, players in their, in their 30s and late 30s. And obviously, MLS has a bit of a reputation on these shores, certainly, I think unfairly now, for being a bit of a retirement league. Of course, there have been lots of young players signed for big money in MLS and over the last 10 years. You look at what Atlanta United have done with South Americans, but maybe less common for that money to go to Europe, to head to Europe to sign a 22 or a 23-year-old player. It tends to be the other way around, right? It's a, a South American player who wants to use MLS as a springboard into Europe and Abad is kind of doing it in, a, in the kind of opposite direction. I think it's a really exciting signing for Charlotte FC. You guys obviously know more about the setup of the team there and the squad construction. But from what I can tell, from, from what Ryan tells me, what I've absorbed by osmosis from Ryan Bailey, it seems like there might be a place for Leo Labada in this uh, Charlotte team as well. Oh, there's there's certainly a place, Graham. I think you know he's somebody that could come in here and, and we're watching some of his his highlights now um, on our Banger. YouTube page. If, if you're listening to our to our audio here on the podcast, you can check out our YouTube page to see some of these highlights. Um, and I think you know knowing that. The Alabada has has ended up in in Charlotte due to all of these circumstances. Feels like a, a bit of a coup for the club. It feels like sometimes you've got to have luck break your way um, in soccer. And I think this is a really good moment for for Charlotte FC in their third season to pick up a player that uh, they otherwise wouldn't have been able to sign. And and this is how it happened. So the one thing I want to know specifically, right, is when when Le Alabada and you can see him here with 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 classy finishes. Uh, settle there and then and then in a nice finish as well he seems like a player that plays with joy that plays with energy what can Charlotte FC fans expect from this player between the lines yeah so just looking at some of his highlights here he does have quite the highlight reel for, as, a, as a Celtic player some of his his goals are are mm -hmm. spectacular so I think Charlotte fans can look forward to that he's predominantly right footed um but his his left foot I'd say is more than just a standing leg he is capable of coming inside and that is a big feature of his game He's got decent pace. He can get in behind. He can stretch the pitch. He's got all-round good technical ability. And that's kind of how I would describe Leo Labada. He's an excellent attacking all-rounder. He does have the characteristics of a, a classic winger, um, but is also a really good passer. And in Postacoglu's system for Celtic, it would be common for him to drag a defender wide, kind of like what we're seeing in this, uh, this clip here, and then slip a pass in behind. That's almost like I planned that uh, to, for that <laughs> clip to show at that point. You're that a pro, was a you're a pro, that, you're a pro. That was a, <laughs> that was a real feature of his play under, under Postacoglu. But he's also got a good eye for goal. He's got a lot of composure in the box. He makes runs into central areas into the box to get on the end of crosses, but then also likes to, to fire off a shot from range with his, his left foot. If, if I had to highlight one area where he could he can improve, it's the consistency of his decision making. But to be honest, he's 22 years old, and that's something that's said of so many young players at that, that age, and they are able to iron that out. The technical ability is there. The physical ability, I also think he's there. Is there. He is quite slight. You know, he's not a, he's not a big dude, you would say, but he was such a prominent figure for an Ange Postacoglu team where he is expected to press from the front, to have that energy out of possession. He doesn't play for Ange Postacoglu if he doesn't have that. So he is an excellent all-rounder. There will be plenty for Dean Smith to work with on a, on a technical and a, a talent basis with this player. Yeah, ev everything you're saying kind of echoes stuff that Dean Smith has said he wanted, which is pressing attackers, runs in behind, things like that. When I watch this highlight reel, I see a, just a great instinct to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys who score tap-ins all the time can get criticized. Oh, they ju they're just scoring tap-ins. You know, it's the Miroslav Klose thing. But he scored a lot of them. Uh, that, that has to mean something. So it's like it, being in the right place for a tap-in is his own skill, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. And that highlight we've just seen there is that a goal against Ross County or St. Johnson, I think. Um, he That is a real feature of his play, is making runs into those central areas. I always think that's 
that's something that Christian Pulisic is is good at. When Christian Pulisic is on form, he's not just getting shots away from outside the box and dribbling past opponents. He's recognising where the ball is going to fall inside the penalty area. And I think Leo Labada has a similar similar quality. Um, so absolutely, I, I I don't know what Charlotte's FC's kind of like number nine situation is and in, in terms of whether you need to add goals to this team in a really simplistic foundational level. But I think Abada will, will do that for, for Charlotte this season. It's it's an exciting prospect, and you know I think we're going to find out here in the next two to four weeks. Ideally, you know, Graham, we have the uh, the Columbus Crew match circled, which is um, in just under three weeks now. Columbus Crew is the, is the next home match for Charlotte FC, and we have that circled as potentially his debut. So this is a player that could come in and come off the bench against the the reigning MLS Cup champion. So as far as making an MLS debut and and making a statement, I'd like to think that in front of, you know, 35, 40,000 fans, he's got a chance to, to come to MLS, even if he doesn't play in that match, right? Get him in the building, put him in a box and and let him take in the atmosphere. The atmosphere, obviously, in Scotland at Celtic is is unbelievable, right? Um, what, what type of um, – we always like to talk about the ability to enjoy your football and connect with the fans. And, and we know that there was, you know, a, an issue bigger than him. Uh, and the fans at Celtic. But before all that, working with Ainge, like, did you see a, a connection there? Or could you see him playing with Joy on the pitch? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Abada, um, there's a goal, I noticed in your your highlight reel that you had there, there's a goal against Dundee United, which I would say is is one of his, it's maybe the biggest goal that he scored for Celtic. From the, Off the top of my head, I think it was um, Celtic had scored a late equaliser. They then went forward in the last few minutes and scored a, a winner. And he's like celebrating, he's in with the crowd and he's celebrating with the fans. So, I think everyone in that Ange Postacoglu team was able to, that's part of what made them so special was they were able to establish that connection with, with the crowd. And Celtic in general um, is a club that likes to have that sort of connection with, with those players. I know, I know every club likes to have that, but Celtic in particular, they like to know the character of their players, the personality of their players. They want players who are going fight to for, fight for the badge. And Abada certainly did that. And that, frankly, that's, that's a factor why I think he's left the club with good wishes despite a difficult situation and obviously there's a difference of opinion there between the majority of the Celtic support and maybe Leal Labada but he's left with good wishes because the fans remember that connection that existed for the last two or three seasons. So he's played for a uh, current uh, Premier League manager, an Ange Postacoglu, and he's he's heading now to coming to Charlotte and to play for a former Premier League manager in in Dean Smith. Graham, something I think that y'all do really well on Total Total Soccer Show is is cover the Premier League and and the ins and outs of of arguably the best league uh, in the world when it comes to soccer. And Dean Smith was there and he did a tremendous job with Aston Villa bringing them bringing them up from the, from the championship. Uh, what, what's your take on on Dean Smith? There was a fantastic article by Tom Bogart in the Athletic today about Dean Smith and him bringing togetherness to this to this Charlotte FC squad. Are you surprised by the early success of Dean Smith, or how did you expect this to go for a manager on his as you know? It's a cliche, but his American adventure. Yeah, frankly, I had no expectations for Dean Smith heading to Charlotte FC. That's not to say that I thought he was a bad hire. I thought potentially he was a good hire. Um, it's just from what Ryan tells me, Charlotte is uh, the last couple of seasons, maybe is a bit of a messy situation, maybe not a, a huge amount of direction mm -hmm. off the pitch and in the front office. So while I, I, I am very much aware that Dean Smith is, is a good manager with a, a good track record, I wasn't entirely sure whether he would go into Charlotte FC and just kind of be consumed by that club in a sense. But the early signs have been positive, right? I have to admit, I only watched the the opening game against NYCFC, um, the, the 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 season opener, um, where Ryan, of course, did his Billy Joe Armstrong uh, impersonation. And um, what the, one of the things that struck me about that performance was. Obviously, there were there were a lot of Dean Smith hallmarks in that performance. The the way that he wants to get attackers into space, and there is that modern football element to how he sets up a team. And I can imagine that's what attracted Charlotte to him in the first place. He, there was also a pragmatism to that the way that he set up that team. It felt like NYCFC. I know they are in a bit of a state of transition of uh, uh, at the moment as well, but they have talent, right? They've got attacking talent, and there will be other teams that play against them this season, and they get sliced open by NYCFC. That didn't happen to Charlotte. They were difficult to play against, uh, out of possession, when they, when they didn't have the ball. And that is the, the thing that I think is going to make a big difference for Charlotte. And it's not necessarily something that I would necessarily associate with 
Dean Smith. That's maybe him showing a different side to to his his coaching and management. But I think that's a positive that says he can adapt to the situation that he's gonna he's gonna find himself in because. We've seen this before in, in, in MLS. And of course, Wilfred Nonsi with the success he's had at Columbus Crew is a bit of an outlier here because he's gone into Columbus and he has got a very clear philosophy and ideology and that has worked for the crew, right? But in a salary-capped league, that's not always possible. And so I think pragmatism isn't actually a, a bad quality at all. It's, it can be a positive quality. And I, I can see that in the way that Dean Smith is setting up this team in the early stages of this season. Yeah, you, you just answered the question that I was about to ask, which was about that magical P word, pragmatism. Like that's a something that we were like desperate for last year in a in a world where we were kind of like the coach was complaining about the, the talent of his players, but then asking him, them to do things that he didn't even think they were qualified to do. He just thought that, that was the system <laughs> that should be played. So kind of All a right. weird situation. I think it's kind of like like you said, like if if Dean Smith could he have he could have been absorbed into this sort of you know toxic culture that he came into but thankfully because we're a new club i don't think any toxicity any had any real chance to set in or anything like that there's definitely been a little bit of a uh, chickens with their heads cut off running around the first two years in different mm -hmm. directions but dean kind of came in and like you know put all the bb's back in the box as they say down in texas and uh kind of got everyone rowing in the same direction so i think that's yeah. pretty been pretty good and I, I just like the way that he the attacking style is so much more direct and just instead of like trying to, you know, they say Arsenal tries to pass the ball in the net. We were trying to like shoot the ball into the offensive zone or something like that. I don't, I don't really know what the analogy is, but it was it got bad watching sometimes. What did you think just watching just the flow and, and the, the, the play? We got a lot of young players. And when yeah. you saw what Dean Smith was doing, it's pretty exciting, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to admit, I've forgotten the, the the name of the young the, the youngster who was uh, scored at, scored at the weekend. Um, Tavares, a uh, yeah, Tavares. Yes, yeah, Portuguese. Yeah, so there are, there are a, a, a number of young players, and that's something we saw at Aston Villa, right, from Dean Smith. The the Norwich City time that the spell for Dean Smith, I, I push that to the side because he comes into that club in a, a difficult situation. They're <laughs> heading for relegation. I do not blame him for giving my boy Billy Gilmore one of the most difficult seasons of his of his career. That's on Norwich City, <laughs> not Dean Smith. So I'm, I'm not counting that against Dean Smith. But you look at what he did at Aston Villa and the number of players who were given an opportunity by, by Dean Smith. Another one of my boys, John McGinn, signed by Dean Smith at Aston Villa. Not necessarily mm -hmm. a young player, but was maybe in his young early 20s, I think, at that point. And his career has just, you know, it, it's, it's rocketed since then. Jack Grealish is the other obvious one at Aston Villa. Um, his career was taken to an entirely different level by, by Dean Smith. So he has demonstrated in the past an, an understanding of what young players need and an, an, an ability to identify what it is in their game that makes them special and harness that a, a ability. So I, I was positive about this appointment when Charlotte FC made it. Now I've got a little bit more evidence that the front office and the club isn't going to get in his way, which was my my fear. Mm -hmm. And so I think with Dean Smith in charge, there is a possibility that, that Charlotte have a really successful season and um, at least, you know, a, a good playoff run is, is, is on the cards for this team, I, I would say. It was more like a bunch of baby ducks just like looking for for a mama duck to come lead them in a row. And that, that <laughs> Dean, Dean is like come in and, and everyone just instantly got in line right behind him. It's been great. Uh, there, there's one other player that uh, is on Charlotte FC that we wanted to talk to you about, Graham. This has been a pleasure. Thanks so much. It's um, your insight and perspective on these topics is, is very much appreciated for um, the Charlotte FC fans. I, I can speak for them. I know. Um, there's somebody that has become a bit of a, a fan favorite, and I know he was a fan favorite at Rangers as well. And it's it's Scotty Arfield, uh, somebody that has a great personality, somebody that uh, seems to be uh, doing the opposite of Lee Alabato, which is finishing his career in MLS. Uh, what What's your take on, on Scotty Arfield, his Rangers career, and what kind of legacy did he leave behind in Scotland? So when Scott Arfield left Rangers, you're right, John, he, he is at a different point of his career to Leo Labada. He had reached the end of a cycle at Rangers. That's not to say he hadn't had a good career at Rangers. Far from it. He'd been a very important player for them, particularly in the run to the Europa League final a couple, couple seasons ago. He was clutch with a couple big goals in, 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 in that run. Really important to that team. Um, it felt like... so. I'm a Sterling Albion fan. We play in the third tier of Scottish football and our rivals are Falkirk. Now, Falkirk are a much bigger club. They have a, 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 a much bigger budget. 
it, the reporting at the time was Scott Arfield was going to go to Falkirk. He started his career with Falkirk. He was going to end his career with Falkirk. And that felt that felt right, to be honest, given how he'd tailed off at Rangers. So I'm going to be completely honest. When Charlotte announced his signing, I thought, I'm, I wasn't sure about that one. I thought maybe, I wasn't sure there was much more juice left in him. So I've been pleasantly surprised by the impact that he's had for, for Charlotte. It looks like he's been given a, a second or a third wind in, in, his, in his career. I always associate Scott Arfield with goal scoring with you know incisive attacking moments with clutch moments in his career as well and while i certainly haven't watched every charlotte game i've, I've caught some highlight re highlight real moments and it seems like he is enjoying a bit of a, a career renaissance while getting the guitar out as well for some yes. uh, some, <laughs> yeah. some dressing room some team sing songs yeah. i assume that ryan bailey has uh, been giving scott arfield some lessons or maybe it's the other way around Maybe maybe uh, say Scotty Arfield that's been given uh, right. Yeah, Scott, Scotty's pretty talented. Scotty could have been a, a pro musician if he hadn't been a pro footballer for sure, or, or so he told us. Or so he told us. But <laughs> I agree with you totally. He scores yeah. important goals, and that's what I love him about him the most. At that point in his career, right? It's like you can think about somebody who has had, and we 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 had a chance to sit down and interview him um, last year, and this is kind of the first time I realized that. Uh, Christian Latanzio might not be doing a great job. As I, we asked him during the interview, we said, hey, so have you had a chance to speak with the, the guys about what it's like playing in the Champions League and scoring a goal against Liverpool and playing at the highest level and what's required there? And Scotty was like, well, nobody's really asked me about that. <laughs> I was like, well, OK, well, you hey, might want to introduce uh, Scotty to 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 the guys in the locker room as somebody that's been there uh, and done that. But he's 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 definitely a fan favorite here in Charlotte. He's in that super sub role, right? He can come on and late in the game and, and try to bag a goal. And and that's a fun place to be at the, the end of your career. I, I really appreciate your time today. I've got one more uh, before before we let you go. And um, you, you mentioned, obviously, uh, Billy Gilmore and uh, some of your Scottish lads. Uh, a big tournament this summer. Uh, Euro 2024, yeah. Scotland, obviously in the field. Uh, how you how you feeling about that? A, a big match against Germany to kick things off. Yep. In the Euros, is, is it an exciting time uh, for Scottish football? Oh, hugely, hugely exciting. I've I've got tickets for all three group stage games, so I'll be going over there to to Germany. I'm very much looking forward to that. I'm excited now. Closer to the time, I'll get more nervous. And then on the day of the game, I'll be absolutely terrified. It'll <laughs> dawn on me. We are playing Germany in the opening game of a tournament in Germany. This cannot Amazing. end well for Scotland. But, you know, putting aside our, 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 our trauma, our past traumas with major tournaments, there's no reason to believe that this Scotland team can't achieve something at, at this tournament. We're the only one of the home nations to never to have made it out the group stage of a major tournament. England have obviously done it multiple times. Wales have done it. They've made the semi-finals of the Euros. Northern Ireland have done it. So it's a little bit embarrassing that Scotland have never managed to make it over that, that threshold. So that is the aim for this tournament. We were at the last Euros. That ended a 23-year run of never not qualifying for a major tournament. Just being at the tournament in, in 2021 was the achievement. This time we want to get out of the group. And if you look at the players that we've got right now, particularly our central midfield, We've got like five central midfielders who are having the season of their, their life. John McGinn's having the season of his life. Scott McTominay is having the season of his mm -hmm. life. Billy Gilmore is in the best uh, form of his career right now for, for Brighton. We've got Lewis Ferguson. I don't know if he's on your ra radar at all. He's the Bologna captain in Serie A, and he's apparently going to go to Juventus um, this summer. Ryan Christie for Bournemouth. He's gone under the radar a little bit, mm -hmm. but he's been one of their best players this season. And then you add in Andy Robertson, and Kieran Tierney and these guys that have really performed and proven themselves at the elite level, our squad has dramatically improved over the last like five to six years. So we have to adjust expectations. If we, you know, flop in this tournament, it will be a real disappointment. But the expectation is that we're, we, we're, we're going to get out of that group. Scott's well, hey, let's go, baby. Let's let's all that's what's yeah. all about. Yeah, we need it's, your support. Come and yeah, come and join I, I, us I, in Germany. <laughs> that's the best thing about uh being an American and uh, over here on US soil when the Euros fire up, you get to kind of pick and choose, hey, who what squad uh, are you gonna be interested in? What's right. a good storyline? And I think Scotland has a chance, like you said, to be a great storyline in the in the Euro 2024 this summer. Graham, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah. Uh but, uh, I wanted to ask you where uh, subscribers, where people can subscribe to the Soccer Dispatch, your your newsletter. Yeah, so um, in terms of where you can find me personally, you'll catch me on the Total Soccer Show pr pretty much every day, which is probably uh, too often. But anyway, that's how, how it goes. Uh, you can also subscribe to my newsletter at thesoccerdispatch.substack.com. 
You get two newsletters a week. One is a roundup of all the weird and wonderful soccer things that happened over the weekend. It's called VAR, which is Valuable Alternative Reading, and that is sent every Monday. And then on Thursday, you get an in-depth story about a non-mainstream um, topic or, or, or story in soccer. So last week was about the Bulgarian title race. There was another about football in Greenland, another about Premier League clubs investing in Scottish clubs and how that might be a deal with the devil. So, yeah, that's it. The soccer dispatch dot substack dot com if you fancy subscribing to that. Beautiful. Well, it's, it's again been a pleasure to have you. And the, the invite is is always open uh, to get yourself on one of those big birds, get across the pond and and come here to Charlotte and and enjoy an MLS match at some point uh, in the summertime when there's not a big Euro 2024 championship happening. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd honestly love to go to a Charlotte game. The, the 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 atmosphere at Bank of America looks incredible. I love the, this is maybe just me, but I love um, when they light up the buildings around the stadium in, in yes. the blue color. That's mm-hmm. that's a really cool cool thing. So yes, I'd love to go to, to Charlotte uh, and meet you guys in, in person and experience that, that, that event first person. I got a ticket yeah. waiting for you in the supporter section, brother. <laughs> I'd I love do. to take it. I do, yeah. He's Graham Ruffin of the Total Soccer Show. Uh, thanks so much, Graham. It's, it's been a pleasure to see you. Uh, we'll be listening to the Total Soccer Show um, throughout the rest of the Premier League season, that's for sure. And until next time, Danny Grams. For the crown, baby. <laughs>